And he said that God had been showing him to rest, receive, become, and release. To rest, receive, and become, and release. And I, I think from my experience, I see more people that learn how to receive and release, but never become. You know, never really rest. Because what it really is, is a, a, a message, an impartation, a whatever you want to call it. And it's getting knowledge, it's getting, it's getting something from God, and then giving it away. But really what it is, is Lord, use me. Use me, use me, use me. And, I, and so it's, it's the desire to be used by God. So give me something, let me, let me give it away. And sometimes it's just give me something, let me parrot what I heard. And because the life is on that word that was given, that's real revelation, it can impact somebody, but the person parroting it never becomes. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because unless you learn how to rest in who you are, who he made you to be, not, not who you're trying to attain to or not how you're trying to please him or perform for him or get approval from him because you're already approved. And until you can rest in being a son or a daughter, I'm going to say son a lot of times, so ladies, bear with me if I call you a son. You can be a son for a little while and we'll be the bride for eternity, so you can be a son for a little while. So if I say son, it's men and women. But it's learning to be a son. And if, if then no matter what's going on around you, no matter what happens that, that kind of, uh, kind of may, may blindside you or try to offend you or, listen, <laughs> the offend thing is huge. I have never heard a believer say, I'm offended because they know they're not supposed to be. So I'm not offended, but... This is what, I'm not offended, but I'm mad, you know, they're offended. So I'm not offended. I'm just, I'm something else. So the offense is strong and you have to learn how when stuff comes, many times when someone offends you, they're not trying to. (laughs) It's like, I did not get my way or the way I think it should be. Well, welcome to life. So we don't rest in our identity as a son, so when something happens, we immediately just defend ourselves or, or, or we, worse yet, yeah, we try to create alliances for other people to have the same offense, many times with the same person. Come here. You know what they did to me? Hey, you come here too. You know what they did to me? Hey, you come here too. You know? And, and it's, it's demonic. So we haven't learned to rest in, well, Maybe I wasn't even treated right. Maybe it was wrong, but you still got to rest. Leif was talking about going to this meeting one time. It was really kind of funny because some people don't know who he is, you know? And if you don't know who Leif is, Leif is a, he's a powerful man of God, very, very powerful man of God, has a really strong anointing. He's a spiritual son to Papa Jack Taylor, and um, he's a person that um, we went, we had the privilege of hanging out with a little bit at Bethel. And believe me, most of these people really, really know Leif, okay? If you don't know him, April, he and Heidi Baker are coming here, and it's going to be powerful. So here to Houston, here to Houston. We're going to be going to that meeting together as a family on that, on that Friday. So anyway, um, getting back to Leif, he, he talked about this meeting he went to. It was really funny, and it was a big meeting big conference, you know, one of these things, and, and he, he was not speaking at this one. He, was just, he just went, and he went and got there a little bit later, and he was trying to find him a spot, you know, like, where do we go? And so he kept walking, like, looking for where, you know, and it was pretty packed. And so he walked, and there was some seats up toward the front that were open, so he walked up there with the person that was with him, and he sat down there, and immediately this usher come, excuse me, no, no, that, that's, and, and got him up, Get, you know, th- this is, these are reserved. And just, and he had to walk past everybody and go all the way to the back, way back there and sat down. It was really dishonoring, but he just went to the, you know, 
back and he just sat there and he, and he lifted his hands and he just was just, Abba, Abba. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to get with daddy, you know. That's, that's all that matters is me and daddy. I just came here for daddy, you know. And he just rested in his sonship. And anyway, the, the main guy for the conference gets up there and starts to speak. And it, it, like I said, it's a big place. And he's going. And all of a sudden he looks, he's like, Leif, is that you back there? Get up here on this platform and just call him up the front. And now, of course, the usher's thinking, oh, my God, who did I just kick off the front row all the way to the back? The guy that's invited onto the platform from the speaker. But he learned how to rest. And we talked about some things and situations that were really intense, really intense. And learn how to rest. But when you learn to rest and receive just the Father's love, just receive that love onto you, it starts to change you. I think Bill Johnson said it best when he, he said, sometimes we repent enough to be forgiven, but we don't repent enough to change. So we're, we're changing the way we're thinking. We're, we turn enough to get forgiven of our sin, but we don't stay in it enough to be changed and to be transformed. That's, that's becoming. We don't want to be people that love. We want to become love. There's a difference. <laughs> we want him to just come all over us where we are like him in all ways. We're growing up into the image of Christ. You understand that, right? So that's what the goal is, not to once in a while do a godly thing and be like, hey, I handled it well today, but to be changed and, to, and that change to affect who we are to become, and then we release. Because as you give it away, it multiplies to you. If you want more than what you receive, you have to give away. If you get a, an encounter with God and it, it, it wrecks you, the thing to do then is to give that away, not to just see how long it lasts. Because you're holding on to something that's just going to just go through your fingers. But when you're like, man, I got hit. I, got, I don't know what this was, and I got an encounter with God, and I just want to go love on somebody. I want to go pray for somebody. I want to go lay hands on somebody. I want to give this away, even if I don't understand exactly what I got. The disciples started giving away things before they knew what they had. <laughs> they were sent out totally unqualified and became qualified on the way. You just, you just go. Um, nothing to do with my message tonight, but... It's free. Just take that, okay? Um, I have an unusual type message tonight. For me, this is unusual. Um, I was just spending time with the Lord and talking to him about tonight, and he said, I want to talk to you about Acts chapter 10. And so I thought, okay, Acts chapter 10. So immediately I thought, Acts chapter 10, 38, right? If you don't know, you, you'll know. Acts 10, 38. It's what I thought of first. And he's like, no, I want to talk to you about Acts 10, all of it, not Acts 10, 38. So I'm like, okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read some verses to you out of the New King James Version. I'm just going to read these to you, and then we're going to go back and look at some things he wants to show us, because I know there's some practical things that we need to grasp, we need to get a hold of, and I just want to take a few moments, okay? This is going to take a little bit. Y'all okay with some word? Yes. Good. Let's just go with some word, Okay. So, Acts chapter 10, why don't we start in verse 1? That's a good spot to start. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. 
Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. For I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision, which he had just seen, meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man who fears God, and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, day Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. While Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one or another nation, one of another nation? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus, through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the, bapti after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging him on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Amen. All of that is 
Acts chapter 10. And Acts chapter 10 is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible concerning any of us who were not born a Jew. Because we were without God and without hope. Having no access. None. We were out. We were left out of the commonwealth of Israel. We were outcast. No hope. When Jesus came, he came to preach to the lost sheep of Israel. And when he ascended, he told them to go preach to the lost sheep of Israel. When he sent the the disciples out, he said to go preach to the lost sheep of Israel. When he sent the 70 after them, go preach to the lost sheep of Israel. But this chapter, something happened that no one was expecting. God's plan was to bring all nations in and all people who would believe in his name. And we got entrance into the kingdom that no one was expecting. This was not the God of the universe as we know now. We just knew him as the God of the Jews. And maybe the one true God, but we didn't have relationship with him. You hear me? This is important stuff. He chooses to reveal this by speaking to someone who's not a Jew. The revelation starts coming to someone who's not a Jew before it comes to the Jews. Uh, This is interesting to me. He chose a devout man. This man loved God. He prayed daily. He gave alms, which he gave generously these gifts to the poor is what he did. That's what he gave. And it came up before God as a memorial. His prayers and his alms came up to God as a memorial. But think about this. He still wasn't saved and wasn't going to heaven. Can you imagine? A memorial is coming up into heaven right now. A memorial. Before God's throne, a memorial is coming up of prayers and good deeds and alms are coming up before God from a man who may never see that memorial unless he gets born again. The prayers ascended, the righteous deeds ascended, but he wasn't going to ascend there because there was still something left out. We cannot get there ourselves. We can't do anything to get there ourselves. We can't do enough good deeds. We can't do enough praying. We can't do enough of anything to get there ourselves. There's one way to the Father. And it's through Jesus Christ and Him alone. He's the gateway. And the remission of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins is absolute necessary to be able to come before His throne. So the prayers may come, the good deeds may come, but no man's coming before Him unless He's clean. Unless the blood washes away the sin and He comes as a righteous person before God. Not because of righteous deeds, but because of the one deed done for him that he couldn't have done for himself. That's an amazing chapter when we look at what's happening. Look, I want to point out some things, and this, this may be dissecting a little bit, but I need to go through some things all the way through that I felt like Holy Spirit wanted to put his finger on. Some of these things are just some practical things. This is a totally different message than I normally do. I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm just going to try to follow, okay? So, First, first of all, Cornelius was a Roman military officer. That's who he was. He chose a Roman military officer who had roughly 80 to 100 men under him. Okay? And that's who the vision comes to. It says in verse 2, he was a devout man, so he was totally committed and he was godly. Okay? He gave alms generously, and he prayed to God always. That's a lot more than many people in the church. Many, 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 many people who believe that they're Christian, but they're they're not generous toward the poor, and they don't pray every day. They don't pray continually. They pray every once in a while. That's just a lot of people that call themselves a Christian. Eh, I'll pray. 
This man prayed continually. He prayed every day. A Roman. Anyway, that's interesting to me. In verse 3, he has a vision. Now, there's a difference in a... Listen. A vision is not where God takes over your imagination and you begin to see. Like, like if I say, okay, close your eyes, and I want you to imagine Jesus. We could do that. And you see him face to face. He's looking at you. That's your imagination. A vision is not your imagination. A vision is very real. Okay? It's not, it's not just... I'm seeing something, it is actually going into the spirit. You are not a physical person. You are a spirit being. That's who you are. You are a spirit. You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. That's who you are. You have a soul. Okay? Your mind, your will, your emotions is a part of you. And you are housed inside a body. Okay? That's your tent. That's your house. But that's not you. Now, if the tent becomes damaged beyond repair, you leave. You don't get to stay. So this house is an earth suit. It gives you permission to be here. This is your space suit, if you will. Okay? If the space suit dies, gets torn up, gets destroyed, you can't stay. You got to go. You're not going to survive. Okay? So this is what gives you authority here. This. Without this, you have no authority in the earth, period. The heaven and the heaven of heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of man. Okay? So this is, he said to man, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion. Okay? This is where we have dominion. He gave it. Okay? So it was important that Jesus was born of flesh and walked the earth as a man. Okay, very important. So he has this vision, and the vision is him going into the spirit. He's probably never done that before. <laughs> he's like, whoa, I'm, I mean, this, he's, when you see in the spirit, you're not making things up. You're trying to observe because this stuff's coming at you. You're seeing things. You're hearing things. And so in a vision, it's called a vision because he's seeing, but you're, there's also, there's audible in, involved too. Because you're in the spirit. So you see and you hear, you feel. I believe all of your senses are aware. I believe you smell. I have smelled the fragrance of the Lord before. If you have not, it's pretty awesome. I I mean, I'm not going to lie and say I haven't. I have been where a fragrance fills and you're like, whoa, what does it smell like? I don't, the most I can compare it to is like frankincense and myrrh. If you've ever had that, that smell, it's like that, except it's. It's not like coming from a spot. It just kind of goes through you. You're like, I smell him. If it fills your vehicle or something, you absolutely know that he just moved into the vehicle. Like, well, he's everywhere. Yeah, he's everywhere, but he manifests himself at times. Okay? When he manifests himself, it's different than he's everywhere. Okay? God is in the trees. He's in the ocean. He's in, but he's not a tree. (laughs) Okay? So let's not confuse him with any of that. Okay, so in verse 4, his prayers and alms came up as a memorial. He probably didn't even pray correctly. You understand that? He probably didn't pray scripturally. I don't believe he prayed scripturally. I don't believe he knew the word enough to do that. He knew there was one God. He believed in the God of the Jews, and he prayed to him. And those prayers who were probably not as good as your prayers... He didn't know how to pray the word. He didn't understand script. You know why I think he didn't understand what what makes me believe he didn't understand? Because as soon as Peter walks in the door, he falls at his feet and worships him. And Peter said, get up. I'm a man. What what are you doing? Oh, I didn't know. That's what he's probably thinking. I didn't know. I was honoring you. You You don't honor like that. You worship one. There's only one who gets your worship. Only one who gets your devotion, period. Okay? That's Jesus. So I believe the man, he prayed in his understanding as much as he could. Let's keep going. In verse 7, notice the angel departed. It says, and when the angel departed, that's interesting. 
And when the angel departed, not when the vision ceased. He said when the angel departed. You know what that means? He was in the spirit, and this was a reality. This vision was an encounter with an angel. Not, I saw an angel, you know, I closed my eyes and I could see an angel. Well, sometimes we see that because we kind of perceive there's something going on. But an open vision's different. It's just, when the angel left, he knew the angel left. The angel departed. The angel walked off. You hear me? So when you go into the spirit, this, this isn't getting weird, is it? It's not too deep or anything. But you go into the spirit. It's not your, it's not your decision. This is not like, I'm going to go into the spirit now and I'm going to see things. This was not his decision. He was praying, boom, oh, whoa, I got visited by an angel in a vision. I've had encounters in the spirit where the Lord has come in ways to me, not where I, have, I can say he sat down and talked with me. But I have had him talk to me. I have had him pass by. I've had him touch me. I have, I have been touched at the altar where I didn't know if it was an angel or if it was God. But I knew it was holy, and it wrecked me, and I, and I, and I just wanted to go to the floor and, get, and just bury my face because I got touched. So I don't know how to just describe that. I've been taken in the Spirit. I wasn't planning to be. I wasn't like, I want to go somewhere. I was praying in tongues. And then I was somewhere else. And I know I was there. First time it happened, I was in a... In a, a a place that I don't know if it's Central or South America, and they were speaking Spanish. I didn't understand, but I was there. And it was a dirt floor, and it was a uh, poorly constructed place that I knew was a house, and I knew the guy praying on his knees was a pastor. I don't know why. I knew. And he was praying for his people, that God had entrusted him for that village, and he was just praying. And I could see him from the back on his knees praying, and I'm just watching him. And then all of a sudden, I see his wife standing beside him, and she can see me. And she started crying. And I could tell what she was thinking. I'm like, it was a weird. She started crying because God sent somebody to stand with her husband. That's why she was crying. And I'm like, this is wild. And I have since, after that time, I have been to a place, and I'm like, uh-oh, this was that place. This was where I came in the Spirit. And now I'm here years later, this is that place. So it's just wild. I've been taken somewhere in Asia and prayed for a man to be healed that was laying on a bed that I knew was dying, and then gone. I wouldn't plan on going to pray. I was praying in the Spirit at a men's group. You know why I was praying in tongues? Because the guy leading the meeting said, we're going to pray in tongues for 20 minutes. And I thought, this is stupid. I mean, 20 minutes. We're just going to, 20 minutes. We're just going to sit here and pray in tongues. And we just sat there and prayed in tongues 20 minutes. And about 10 minutes in, I got taken. And I'm like, whoa, hello. And there's been other things that happened, but it may or may not interest you. Some, you know, when I would hear some things, I would think, well, is that available? I want it. I, I'm just that kind of person. I'm, that's available? I didn't know it was available. Can I do that? Some of you are not like me. Some of you are like, I don't want that. I don't want that. That's okay. It didn't hurt. Or you're probably one of those, if it happens to me, I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> uh, okay. There are some important things to glean from the scripture about the angel departed. There's a difference between a vision and our imagination. Keep that in mind. There is a difference. There are true visions. Yeah, it is biblical what I experienced. Paul was taken to, to heaven. He says, he says it in this, in this third person way. He says, I know a man, whether in the spirit or in the flesh, I don't know. But he was taken up into heaven, and he starts to tell a story. He's talking about himself. It's very biblical to be taken. It's also about translation where you can be taken from one place to another. There was baptism happened. I don't know if you read the story. <laughs> and as soon as the man came out of the water, this unit comes up, and, the, and 
Philip's gone. As soon as he came up, he just took him somewhere. We had a, a friend that used to take uh, Bibles into a, another country. I'm not going to say which country, but another country years ago when it was not legal to bring Bibles into the into that country, and they would bring they would they would smuggle Bibles in and they would minister to these people that were there. And there was a man that was, became a pastor in the underground church, and he would ride a bicycle. That's all he had. He would take a bicycle to go preach the gospel everywhere he went. But sometimes God took him a lot farther places, so he would translate. He would just he'd just take him, and he'd wind up another another town. And he'd preach the gospel. And God would bring him back home. It happened all the time. He would, I mean, but he was such a humble man. And he would just talk about, yeah, God took me over here. And he would preach. People would get saved. God take him over here. And that's how he moved around. And so these people decided, we want to bless him. You know, they're from the United States. We're gonna, so we're going to raise money, and we're going to get him a car so he can preach the gospel. So they got him a car. But the only problem was it was another country. And the car kept breaking down, and he couldn't get parts. For the car. And once he got the car, God never translated him again. He hated that car. <laughs> he hated that car. Because he never got translated because now he had a car. <sighs> Bigger and better is not always the answer. Sometimes just obey God and watch him do some things. You know these things are real, right? You know this, this, this book that you believe in, the whole thing, a snake talking to a woman, all these animals two by two and more going onto a boat. All that stuff's real. You know that an axe head floating, ocean parting, dry land. That's your God. That's your Bible. Why are, we're so civilized that we are We've lost all belief in anything. We start talking about some of these things. I, I, can, I can see the RCA dog look on people's faces. I say, yeah, I got, I got translated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know whether to believe it or not. Well, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> but I read Genesis and you go, oh, yes, amen. Amen, I believe that. You believe that a snake talked to Eve. Yeah. A snake. Yeah, I believe that. Okay. But I got translated. Oh, I don't know if I believe that or not. Why? Because you're like me. And if you're like me, you're not better than me. I haven't been translated. <laughs> Maybe you just need to believe God will do anything with you. Anything. Anything. It's not like I'm special. He'll do it for anyone. No respecter. He's not a respecter of person, but that does not mean what he does for me, he'll do for you. No respecter of persons does not mean if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. It does not mean that. You know what it does mean? It's available to you. But maybe you're not doing what I did to get what I got. So don't say, if he did it for him, he'll do it for me. What if I sow and sow and sow and sow and sow into the gospel and sow into the poor and give to the needy and all of a sudden I reap this big harvest and they go, I claim what he got. He just got a hundredfold blessing and I claim it. God's no respecter of persons. What he did for him, he'll do for me. Well, did you sow? I mean, you're just claiming the blessing, but you're not, you're not claiming the sacrifice. You're not claiming the giving when you didn't have it. You just trusted and you had to find $5 on the side of the street to get your gas money to get to church. You're not, you don't want that. You just want the harvest. So no respecter of persons just means it's available to whosoever will believe. It's available for whosoever will obey and do. But he's a rewarder. Yes. Rewards are not gifts. Gifts are for everybody. Rewards are earned. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So he doesn't reward everybody. You all get rewards. You all get a participation trophy. <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank you. But the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro across the face of the earth looking for someone whose heart is turned completely toward him that he might show himself mighty on their behalf. What, what does that mean? No respecter. He's a, he'll do it for anybody who will turn their heart completely toward him. <sighs> Isn't that good? He's, Paul said, I run as if one person gets the prize. 
as if one wins the race. I run that way. I don't run like, come on, y'all. Let's all cross the finish line together. That's not how he runs. He runs like, I don't care if you're leaving stuff behind or not. I'm going for it. That's the way you're supposed to live the gospel. The, the way you live this life is, if none of y'all get it, I'm on it. Well, I don't believe in financial prosperity. It's okay. I'll take it. <laughs> well, pastor, that's just wrong. Who said I'm keeping it? Amen. Who said I want it to accumulate? To get my bank account big. I want to give into every good work. I want to have enough to give into every good work. And you can't do that just saying, well, I just want to meet my needs. Just take care of what my necessities are. So you don't want to give anything. That's greedy. That's stingy. Believe for blessings, you can give it away. Right? Okay, let's keep going. I'm, I'm clicking, though. We're going. We're going. Okay. Verse 9, Peter says, Peter prays and goes into a trance or a vision. He goes into a trance. He's not planning this. He's praying. You know what he's thinking about? You wanna, you wanna, I can tell you what he's thinking about. Up here. Not here, but up here I can tell you what he's thinking about. You know what he's thinking about? Biscuits and gravy. Because it says he's hungry, very hungry. And while they're preparing the food, he goes up and prays. Lord, bless his food. <laughs> he's hungry. It's not, sausage it's not sausage gravy. No, it is, it is it's kosher gravy and biscuits. <laughs> so he's, he's hungry. And in his prayer time, he goes into a trance. What does that mean? It means he goes into the spirit. You'll find in verse 17 and 19, a few verses later, that he calls it a vision. So that trance is another encounter. It's another vision. He goes into a trance. Um, I have been in trances before. Not, not, don't, look, don't go by those stupid movies like, uh. You know, it's not, it's not a trance. <laughs> you're aware of what's going on around you. You can hear what's going on around you, but you're somewhere else. Some of y'all had it happen when you've been prayed for and you just, you did a dirt nap, you know, you just, you fell. And then you're laying there and you can hear everything going on, but at the same time, the Lord's talking to you. And so you're hearing what he's saying, but I can also hear them talking about they're going fishing tomorrow. And, I'm, I'm, and I can hear you talking about that right over here. But he's talking to me about something else. And you're in this trance. And you don't know how to explain it, but you don't want to get up. You can get up. You can stop it. You can. You can just get up. You can resist. You can quench the spirit. The Bible says don't do that. One of the most powerful services I've ever been in, and I've told the story a bunch of times, I don't care, I'll tell it again, was in Costa Rica, going to preach, and it was one of the nicest churches we had preached in on those kind of trips because they had an air conditioner. That was big. I mean, we're like, they have an air conditioner. And they had a screen about that size with words on it for the worship songs. That is unheard of. We had been in places that didn't have all the walls. We had been maybe a fan. And every once in a while it passes you. <laughs> and you're just like, yes. And then it keeps going. And you are soaked, soaked. 100 and something degrees in that building. So we're in a place now, an air conditioner. They had a worship team. They had matching outfits and tambourines. This was like a big-time church. It wasn't big. probably held about 600, 700 people. But that was still a pretty good-sized church. And I got up there to preach. No, in my opinion, no atmosphere for what I wanted to go into. My opinion. Because I like worship. Okay? Some people like praise. And I, like, you know, I, I can get into both, but I like worship. What's the difference? I don't like the high energy stuff that much. We can go for there for a little while, but let's, let's get into his presence, and I want to go into some intimate worship, right? They had zero. It was, da -da 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 and they all did it together, and I'm standing there like, yeah. And after about 30 minutes of that, I'm done. You know, I'm not young anymore like I used to be where I can just do it. I just want to like, let's get on our knees and worship a little bit. And so they went on and on and on, and then they introduced me. And I'd never been there before, so I get up on there, and, and everybody stands up. They were so sweet. They all stood up, and they all clapped. And the place was packed. I'm like, wow. 
And they said, you know, I had come the night before. So they said, he's like family, and we're just going to welcome him again. And they're just, I'm sorry, the night I came before, the night before, was packed. Power of God moved. Now I'm back. I get up there. It's half full. I'm like, where's everybody at? I was disappointed. I was disappointed. Where are, where are they people? God moved. Half people are gone. The pastor told us later, well, the reason it's so light is because I told all the people from our church not to come. And he said, because we wouldn't have any room for anybody else. So I told them to stay home so visitors could come. And we're like, oh, okay. And we're trying not to be disappointed. And trying not to look at numbers and empty seats. And so I get up, and the front is still the dance team and the leadership. So they know. And so he's like, let's well, And they all stand up, and they're welcoming. And they just clapped. And so I said, well, let's just give glory to whom glories do. Let's just lift our hands, Jesus. I magnify your name. That's all I got out. Literally, I, I magnify your name. <laughs> and he fell. And when he fell, it was heavy. And I just went down to my knees. I could have resisted. And then I went to all fours. And I could have resisted. But it was heavy. And then I started getting nervous because I'm I can hear everybody. And I'm the guest speaker. And I'm the first speaker, but there's still another speaker after me. And I'm not doing anything. I'm not speaking. I'm just on my hands and knees. And the worship team's not playing. And they're on the, on the, they're on the platform. And I, and I just, and finally I'm like, Lord, I'm the speaker. I need to get up. And he said, go ahead. But you asked for this. I ain't moving. I'm not moving. So I just stayed there. Why well, everybody stared at me. And then people started running to the altar, crying. One, then two, then three, then four, then more, then more, then more, then more. Then it, and then it full. And the power of God just started moving. Nobody's preaching. No one's talking. He just started moving. And my friend decided, Sidney's stuck. I need to go help him. So he runs up on the platform, and he kneels down and comes over like this. He goes, hey, hey, Sidney. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you. And he goes, Sydney. And when he touched me, boom, he fell. <laughs> and when he fell, he hit the worship leader's foot with his hand, and then he fell. <laughs> and then all you hear is, Burr! and he falls. And then God just kept, and then it really started filling up, and people are crying because nobody's doing this but God. And Holy Spirit kept moving. And then he started baptizing people in the Holy Spirit. Three boys over here about 12 years old with their arms around each other. I watched them as they just went like this. They just, just started getting heavy, heavy, heavy until they were like this. And then they put their hands out, and then they all went, and they all just started speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit just went. Whoosh. And then I heard a woman wailing on the steps, over, just wailing, wailing on the steps over here. And then she started speaking in tongues. Found out later that was the pastor's wife, and she never prayed in tongues before. She got baptized right then. Boom. And then it just went on. And it went on. And it went on. And then we did something stupid. And we tried to direct it a little bit. And he started lifting. And then I cried. And I said, Lord, please, please, please don't go. Please don't go. And he went. Came right back down again. i never seen that before. Never seen him come back. And he fell again. And it went on for two to three hours. Nobody preached. Nobody preached. He just moved. And then they all at the altar started singing in tongues like the same song. <laughs> You're just like, what in the world is going on? And then the lady tried to come on the, on, the, on the microphone and sing, and the keyboard started coming in underneath it, and you heard, pow, and both of their mics went out. And the Holy Spirit said, strong right here. He said, one sound, no voice above another. And he wouldn't let them come in on the instruments. He just moved. And after it was all done, my interpreter came up to me, a 20-something-year-old Catholic kid. <laughs> His eyes about this big. I'd watched him over by the wall like this all night. And he couldn't move. He was frozen right there. And he walked, he says, are y'all going to pray for the sick? And I go, I don't think so. I think he's done. And we didn't do anything. And I said, are you hurting? Yeah, I have real bad back pain. 
I said, okay, let's pray. I mean, God's moving like wildfire. Laid hands on him, nothing. I'm like, no way. Prayed again, nothing. Jason, get over here. Man, he's got anointing for backs. Just pray for him. Jason prays, nothing. I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, do you have one leg shorter than the other? And he goes, no. I said, sit down. So he sat down. I picked his feet up. I said, Shh, look at your legs. And he had a leg like this. I'm like, no. Oh, Lord Jesus, just touch him. Nothing. I held his ankles like that. I said, I said, grow. And his leg went, Toop. and he goes, his eyes got like this big. <laughs> and he went, he got up, and he's like, oh, my gosh. And then God healed a guy with kidney stones that was, like, in tears. 50-something-year-old guy, just like, I mean, just like, he's talking to you like this. He's just like, I mean, he just can't stand the pain. He's just like, no. Laid hands, he went, he goes, no way. No way. And he just, God just healed him. Like three or four people, everybody else was gone. Oh, see, I love. That's what I've cried for. I mean, like, I, I know people say, you are a revival. Uh, I, I understand what you mean. I do understand what you mean. I just don't agree with you. I understand what you mean to a, to a point. I don't sit in a chair and just pray, God, come do everything. I, don't, I believe we go. I believe we do. We lay hands on the sick. We teach that, right? We teach fire starters. Go and do, Right? But God can do things that we can't do. I, I still want a burning bush to show up whether you want one or not. I don't need a burning bush. Well, then don't have one. I want that and the other. I don't need a cloud and a pillar of fire. I want a pillar of fire. I want a cloud. I want a cloud to fill the room. If you don't want a cloud, don't get a cloud. You go be Billy Graham. I want Billy Graham and a cloud. I want it all. Who said we got to choose? I want the supernatural God that they go, oh, whoa, 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 and for fear fall to their knees. Yeah. I want the real God. I have seen it. I'm not making this stuff up. I've seen it. Why don't I, why don't I want more of that? Every time I encounter something like we encountered in Costa Rica, I think, God, do it again. And then in, in, in Honduras, going to eat at Denny's. We're just having a late breakfast. We fly out tomorrow. Crusade is over. We're done. Eat, go to bed, go to the airport. That's the plan. But God, we finish, finish eating and, hey, has anybody ever told you about Jesus? That's all we said. And then, well, I don't know. Would you like to know him? Well, I don't know. Well, that's exciting. And then a little bit of talk, a little bit of talk, all of a sudden it's like, you want? Yeah. I think I do. And then one guy being trained just looks and says, can I ask a question? I'm like, sure. What's your question? If I pray this prayer, how do I keep him forever? <laughs> oh, well, that's easy. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I watch people run from a packed out Denny's in Honduras. Run from different parts of the restaurant to pray the prayer because they overheard and they're running until you get a dozen people or more that are put and they put their hands in like a like a football scrimmage and they all and they all prayed a prayer to receive Jesus and then they started getting filled with the holy spirit and we're having to hold them up because they're still working the managers are in there the hostesses are in there the waiters are in there and they're all getting filled with the holy spirit and so after we held them up and said you got to stand up you're working they went back and took off, and we're like, wow, was that amazing? And then, boom, a guy stands up over here. Nobody speaks English. We're doing all this through an interpreter. And a guy stands up over here and starts speaking English, prophesying. These are men of the most high God, and God is sending the kingdom. And, and he just starts prophesying. And we're like, we're in a revival service in Denny's. <laughs> he prophesies. And then another man calls me over to his seat and starts saying, where are you from? What's going on? God sent me here to open up schools and to help people and build houses. And he starts talking about connecting to help the poor of Honduras. And I'm just sitting there like, what is going on? And then all those people that got saved, they start coming back. Only they've gone in the back. And this is the cook. This is the other cook. This is the one that was working back here. And they bring another dozen. And they get saved. 
And then this girl comes up with it. She had her hair colored funny. She had some piercings on her, and she looked hard. And you knew she had been abused. You knew it. She didn't want anything to do with men. And she was just, we started to pray for her. And then finally it was like, no, come here. And so we just grabbed her hands, and I mean the power of God just waved over her. And she broke. And God was healing things that we could not heal. And when we came back a month or so later and pulled up in the parking lot at like 1 o'clock in the morning, and you see that girl with her face pressed against the glass looking in the, at the parking lot, and we're like, and she runs out there and gets a big bear hug, healed. And the owner wants to meet everybody because he's a Christian, and his whole restaurant's changed. And they're like, oh, you don't understand. That's Big Red. And he, he, uh, he owns that restaurant, that restaurant, that restaurant, and the Christian Broadcast Network for Honduras. And we're like, guess what? All that stuff that happened, one of the guys was sitting at the end of the table with a camera, and it was all videos. So he wanted a copy so he could put Spanish subtitles underneath it and put it on his network about the revival at Denny's. So you can be revival if you want to. I believe God sent us there, and I believe God used us, and I think all that. But you know what I felt like? Absolute nobody. <laughs> I, I did something really difficult. Do you know Jesus? Would you like to? Wow, you're anointed. But Jesus created a revival, and it didn't make any sense. And it just whirled around till we had people standing everywhere getting prayed for and falling out and the power of God on them and people getting inner healing. That's revival. And it's not about a man, a woman. It's about Jesus getting his reward. I got the favor of one waiter. And then God just opened the door. You know what I did? He came back to the table. Y'all need anything? Y'all need any refills or anything? I said, yeah, I, I need a refill on my chocolate malt. And he started laughing. He goes, well, we don't refill those. I said, I know. He goes, but, I'll, but for you, I will. And he grabbed it, and they all looked at me like, what? I said, you come refill my chocolate malt, man. <laughs> and so we started kind of chuckling with each other a little bit. And next thing you know, hey, do you know Jesus? Hey, do you? God used a chocolate malt yeah. to bring revival to Denny's. I think that's funny. So Peter goes into a trance. It's not initiated by him. It's a vision from the Lord. And in these visions, these type of visions, we may see the Lord, we may hear the Lord, or an angel, or the Lord may reveal revelation visually. Like you'll see a movie or you'll see something act out. He, he may even show you someone that you know or know of, and all of a sudden they're talking to you. I always wonder when that happens, and it's so God, are they having something happen too? <laughs> Where they're like, God sent me somewhere, and I spoke to somebody. <laughs> they're like, yeah, that was me. I saw you. <laughs> Went through a very, 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 very painful ordeal, and I'm... I'm suffering because I'm losing spiritual kids and I'm not going to be with them anymore. And, I'm, and it's just, I'm just, ugh, I'm crushed. And I told my wife, this hurts. This hurts. And I go in the bathroom and I'm shaving. And all of a sudden, look in the mirror and a screen popped up in front of me. I, I was shaving, feeling really crummy. The screen went. Graham Cook looked at me. He goes, DQ, and the screen left. <laughs> I'm like, but I knew what that meant because he had come and taught in the school, and he went through a season of crushing and everything being going wrong, and he ended up digging graves in a graveyard. That's what he was doing for a job. He was digging graves by hand, and he said, "I dug them right," and I down that hole singing. And other guys would come in and sit at the hole to hear me sing and worship Jesus. 
And he wrote a whole letter to his spiritual father telling him all the stuff he was going to. And his spiritual father sent him a postcard back that just said, DQ. And he said, that meant die quietly. <laughs> Shut up. So I'm, I'm sitting here like, oh, God, I'm not going to see my kids. You know, this is uh, uh. And Graham looked at me, DQ. I'm like, I got a word from God. I, I was fine. I was fine. I walked in the room and said, hey, babe, I just got a word from God. I'm good. I just got a word from God. Graham came in the bathroom <laughs> and told me to DQ. And I was fine. And immediately... Immediately, I get a phone call. I get promoted. Immediately, I'm traveling the world with my spiritual father. Next thing you know, I just went, no more. I'm not saying another word. I'm going to die quietly because I have a word from God. I didn't have someone that didn't have compassion say, just be quiet and quit complaining. I had a word from God that came through a servant of God that I knew was a word from God. And he can come in a vision. Verse 20. I want to read verse 20 to you real quick. This is what it says. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. God said, Peter, Get up, go down there and go with them. Don't doubt anything. I sent them. You know what's interesting? God didn't send them. Not directly. He talked to Cornelius through an angel. And Cornelius sent his servants. And God said, I sent them. You know what God told me? He said, when you are submitted under authority, and that authority hears from God, and you serve under that, I sent you. I sent you. That Listen, this is not some strange, weirdo, spiritual control manipulation thing. I'm the leader. Do whatever I say, and God's sending you. That's stupid. Okay? Just understand that when the Spirit of God speaks to someone and they say, look, I, I'm, I, I need you to go do this. God has told me this needs to be done. And you do it, God has sent you. And he takes that and rewards you for your obedience directly to him. Not for your obedience to the person, for your obedience to him. Peter, get up. I sent them. Those men never heard the voice of God. They heard the voice of their master saying, go. <laughs> and God said, I sent them. That's good stuff. It's good to me. Submission to authority is a good place to be. Whoo. Verse 24. He called together his relatives and close friends. God didn't tell him to. He said, send for Peter. He's going to come and speak to you. And you know what he said? I get all my relatives, all my friends, all these people close to me. Y'all need to come here because this man's coming to tell me what God's saying. There's a lot to be learned there. You know what, there, you know what it really says? When God sends someone to you, like in two weeks, we have Chad Gonzalez coming. God has sent him here. That is no joke. That's a big deal. Two nights. You know what that means? Go get your friends. Go get your relatives. Go get people that will listen to you and tell them, you need to come and hear this guy because God sent him. Um, that's not, again, that is not some spiritual manipulation of getting people into a church. That is the honoring of what God is doing when he brings someone as a gift into your region. And when we dishonor and we just like, eh, God sees that. 
The gifts from God are not the anointing on a person. The gifts from God are the person. That is the gift. Prophets are a gift from God. Pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles, they're a gift from God to the body. And when we honor what God has set up, he, he notices. And what you give attention to, what you honor, increases in your life. Why, that's why when we do this fire starters course, when we start talking about all of these things, it starts to increase in your life. We start, all of a sudden, it's like, man, I got an opportunity to pray for somebody. I saw somebody get healed. I got a word of knowledge. I never got a word of knowledge before. I got a prophecy. Never prophesied. I laid hands on someone. They got healed. I had never done that. You are honoring something, and you're paying attention to it and giving attention to it, and it begins to multiply in your life. It's a spiritual principle. But if you go, oh, that was good. That's a good teaching. I kind of like that. Nothing's going to happen. <laughs> That's where religion comes in. Remember we talked about the root of religion? The root of religion is, amen, I agree with that, but I'm not doing anything about it. It's like when the anointing comes and, and someone's preaching to you and all of a sudden it hits you. That's all that matters. It hits you. Like all of a sudden, God's telling me that I'm supposed to feed the homeless. Whatever. Boom. God's telling me I'm supposed to feed the homeless. I'm supposed to do something about that. I'm going to do something about that. It's time to step. It's time to step uh, even if it's small, I'm going to do something about that. And then you don't. Then the next time the preacher says, we need to feed the homeless, you're going to go, amen, come on. That's right, we do. And you agree with it. And it bears witness with you. But you didn't move. Then it becomes religion. It's understanding a truth and agreeing with it, but doing nothing. And there's no fruit from that. And that's what church becomes when it becomes religious. It's we're agreeing with all these Bible sayings, but not doing anything and not encountering God, not moving in the power of the Spirit because we don't need the power of the Spirit. I'm satisfied. It's okay. And the Bible says that He takes the hungry and they go away. They go away filled. And those who came full go away empty. Because I'm good. I never want to be in a place where I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I want to be content and divinely dissatisfied. I got to have more. I got to have more. More of him. More of him. <sighs> Actually, I, I got to say something about that. It's not really the more of him and less of me. You know, that's kind of illegal. That's the prayer of John the Baptist at the end of the covenant. God doesn't want less of you. He wants all of you. He, he does. He, wants, he doesn't want all Jesus. My pursuit is all him, but he wants all of me. If he didn't want me, then he created us for nothing. He created us not to see himself in the mirror, <laughs> like, oh, another me. He created us to fellowship with us. And he's like, I'm going to let you experience what I experienced. This is dominion. This is creation. It's creativity. Now watch this. Give it away and you'll experience something else I have. Fullness of joy. My joy will be in you because you'll give it away to somebody else. And he wants you to experience all of that. So he has all of you. And the more you keep giving away everything he gives you, the more it comes up in you. And he's like, oh, I got all of you now. I got all of you. It's like, it's like we, we talked about, and y'all will agree with this, but I, I always hated that nameless, faceless generation that's coming up. I've been talking about this for years. That just never sat right with me. He's looking for a nameless, faceless army. No, he's not. He's looking for an army that he knows every face, every name. He knows you, and he loves you, and you're unique. He does, listen, God is colorblind. No, he's not colorblind. He made every race, and he loves them all, and he wants to see them all work together. He doesn't want to see them all just... You're all the same. Everything about your nationality does something in you. You have traits. Listen, every race makes fun of the other race. Don't act religious because you know why we make fun of? Because there are things that are funny about each one of us. I can stand up here and do some things and say, which one am I? Yo, that's a white boy right there. I could do some, oh, man, that, that's, that's a man of color right there. Oh, oh, that's Spanish right there. I could do some just 
characteristics, and you would know who I was imitating. Pastor, that's wrong. No, it's not. We're all different, and God likes all of it. All of it. You're going to be mad when you get to heaven and you see these angels in chariots of fire with big spinning rims on the side. (laughs) You're going to be mad. Oh, no way. (laughs) Anyway, let's keep going. (laughs) He's just fun. Verse 27 says there were many that were invited when he went and got his relatives and friends. Many. He filled that place up. And Peter walks in and went, whoa. <laughs> I mean, he said, there's many here. It's a bunch of people. I didn't expect this. I came to talk to you. Verse 28 reveals the meaning of the vision that was given to Peter. He saw that sheet drop down, remember? Creeping thing. Taken back up. And he pondered, what in the world does that mean? It doesn't mean pork is okay. It doesn't mean bacon. That's not what it means, just in case you're wondering. Because he said, now I understand that God knows, no, shows no partiality, that in every nation, that which he's cleansed, I cannot say is unclean. It's about people. It's not about food. It was never about food. Peter was, stri- Peter was just a fisherman. He wasn't even a religious guy coming up. He was a fisherman. And he said, no way, I have never eaten anything unclean, even as a fisherman. He was a fisherman that never ate a fish that had skin only and no scales. He never ate a crab. Poor guy never had a shrimp or a lobster. He didn't. Do you know why God gives you those laws? Because if you research those things, you know this. It's dietary. It's healthy. It's for our health. It's for our health. It just is. They're not healthy to eat those things, but I like them. <laughs> ah. Verse 30 gives us more detail into the life of Cornelius. It says not only in verse 30, it says not only that he was praying, but get this, he was fasting. He wasn't born again, and he fasted. We don't even do that. (laughs) You know what we call it? Works. That's works. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) It does work. (laughs) We're supposed to do righteous deeds. You know there's deeds that we're supposed to do? Righteous deeds, not righteous beliefs. You show me your faith by your words. I'll show you mine by my actions, by my deeds. There's going to be something corresponding action to what you say you believe. Amen. Brother David Hogan, I don't know if you, if you knew this or not, but he said this. He said, I was after something that I was not seeing anybody else do out there. I wanted to raise the dead. He said, how would I know if you had a headache and it got healed? But if you were raised from the dead, nobody could fake that one. He says, so I went after dead raising. He says, so I went through the scriptures from the front to the back, and I looked for something all the way through trying to find out how these people got the hand of God involved, how they got his attention, how God moved so mightily in all these people's lives. And he said, you know what I found out? Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. He said, if you submit your soul to prayer, and submit your flesh to fasting, the power of God will move in your life. And it's true. But it's kind of, it's not not a good fad anymore, you know? And we won't even do it unless somebody proclaims one. (laughs) Pastor said we're going to fast for three days next week, and I'm going to join the fast for three days. Cornelius did not get that from the synagogue. He couldn't go in the synagogue. He was just a, Roman soldier that believed in the one true God and fasted and prayed. He fasted and prayed and gave to the poor. (laughs) You got about 10% of the people in the church do that. Fast, pray, and give to the poor. About 10%. That's true. That's a true true statement. About 10%. About 10% of the church finances all churches. About 10% of the church gives. 
every church. The spirit-filled, non-denominational, on fire for God, about 10%. I know, it's crazy. It's just real. Ah, let's keep going. I, I can't get on that. I can't get on that. Let's go. Lord, help me. Ah, okay. Verse 34. When following the Holy Spirit, we first get clues by listening on the inside and letting the Spirit of God lead us. Peter said, he, he walks in the house and he starts to look around. And he said, I perceive now that God wants to do this for everybody. I, I see what this vision was, and I perceive now that he's sending me to everybody. See, all he knew was, I'm hungry, I'm praying, a sheet with food that I'm not supposed to eat, and I'm hungry. And it goes three times, and he sits there and goes, what in the world are you trying to do? What are you telling me? Why are you tempting me? Why are you putting food commercials on when I'm hungry? And he's trying to figure out what's going on. And he still hadn't figured it out. And then he says, I sent them, go with them, and don't doubt. And he goes and says, okay, all right, all right, all right, I'm slow, but I've, I've got it. See, we read the story. We know the story. Peter doesn't know the story. Peter's living the story. And he gets to the house, and he's like, the sheet, the food, don't call. I got it. I got it. I got it. I perceive. When God leads you, the truth of the matter is he's going to give you clues and tips, and he's going to, st- most of the time, it's not word for word. When he tells Peter, he didn't say, Peter, get up. Go with these men. I sent them. This is what I told you about when I showed you the sheet. The explanation, interpretation of what you saw is that it's about people, and it's not. He didn't say that. He let him discover it for himself. See, we think we need God's interpretation on everything, and he does not do it because we go, what does that mean, God? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Sometimes he just says, go. And in your obedience, you get the next step. And then when he got that, he still wasn't sure. He's like, I'm not supposed to be in here. That's what he tells him. I'm not supposed to be in here. You know I'm not supposed to be in here. I'm not supposed to be talking to you. But I perceive that God sent me because he's wanting this gospel to go to everybody. But Peter wasn't ready for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to hit him. He wasn't ready for that. He's still talking. And they didn't even pray the sinner's prayer. Hezekiah 4.12 tells us you have to pray a sinner's prayer. If you don't know, there is no book of Hezekiah, so don't look for it, okay? There is no sinner's prayer. They believed. They're listening to him, and he talks about the one who was crucified for the sin of man. And then he says, but he got raised from the dead. (laughs) And they believed. And the Holy Spirit falls on them. They began to speak with other tongues and glorify God. And the Jews are going, what the? Have you ever seen anything like this? And he says, how can we forget, forgive, forbid them water? Let's baptize them. And they're like, this is amazing. And then guess what? Then they leave. Peter, you got some splaining to do. Now he's getting called on the carpet because he went and talked to people that weren't Jewish. And he had to go say, hey, not my fault. Look, a sheet, animals, didn't eat them. He said go, had a vision, had an encounter, went, said what I was supposed to say. Holy Spirit falls, they spoke in tongues. Guess what? Speaking in tongues is an evidence, at least one evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's right there. It was the evidence to them, like, whoa, they just got the Holy Spirit. And it's still an evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Does that mean everybody speaks in tongues? Mm, Come on. You know what it means? It means everybody can. I believe everybody can. Do all speak with tongues? That's not what you're trying to interpret correctly. That does not mean... Praying in the Holy Spirit. It means 
like speaking before you in tongues, and then someone else comes up and interprets. Everybody's not called to do that. Everybody's not called to prophesy. Do all have healing? I may not have a gift of healing, but I've seen a lot of people get healed. Through the power of the word of God and praying for people, I've seen people get healed. It doesn't mean I have a gift of healing. I've got a lot of people saved. doesn't mean I'm an evangelist. But I can still lead someone to Jesus, right? Oh, Lord, I was ahead of time. Okay, I'm going to finish up. Okay. Verse 35. Let me read that to you real quick. But in every nation, whoever fears him, uh uh-oh, and, uh uh-oh, and what? And what? Oh, no. I live by faith, not by works. Well, you need to have some works, too. So this says, in every nation, this is what I perceive, Peter said, in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteous, works righteous deeds or works righteousness is accepted by him. You know what? Cornelius was accepted by him for what reason? Because he feared God. The Bible said he feared God. And he gave to the poor, right? Those are deeds of righteousness. He gave to the poor. And those alms came up as a memorial before God. So guess what? God accepted him because of what he did, not because of what he said. Just saying. It's in your Bible too. It's right there. 